Hello and welcome to Fully Charged News. Now, I'm going to do a tiny little bit of a rant right at the end of this episode. I don't want to rant, I want to deliver good news, optimistic news, forward-looking, positive news, not rants. But there's a little bit of a rant. I can feel it in my waters. But first, there's been this song. It's a, it's a bit of an earworm. It's been driving me mad. It was a, a Cliff Richards song that came out in 1970. It's called Goodbye Sam, Hello Samantha. Goodbye, Joe. Hello, Joanne. Um, it was a little bit creepy and cheesy even back in 1970 when basically all British culture was extremely creepy and cheesy. I assume the song was meant to illustrate the transition from boyhood to manhood. Uh, you know, that you have your male friends and then you leave them and you fall in love with women. And it was also possibly to, you know, reassure the general British public that uh, Mr Richards was a, you know, a, a nice Christian heterosexual. Anyway, let's move on from that because that's not what this is about. What it was, was I was realising I was saying goodbye to something that I was very close to and I was looking forward to meeting something that I hadn't yet met. That sounds even cheesier. It was I was singing it while I was driving uh, my Tesla Model S uh, 85 to Henley, which is in fact the constituency of the British... Uh, politician Mr B Johnson and I was basically returning the car to the leasing company Drive Electric whose offices are very near there so I've had the car for four years and uh, it was on a lease and the lease which was already extended for a year finally ran out but the idea behind extending the lease and you're allowed to laugh at my pathetic endless optimism is that I was holding on to it for long enough to uh, swap it for a Tesla Model 3. Now, like many thousands of other people in this country, I'm still waiting for my Tesla Model 3 to uh, be driven off the ship. But we have driven 70,000 miles in that first Tesla, and I was very aware of that as I gave it its final wash just before I drove it back because it was a little bit dirty. You know, as I was washing, I was thinking about, you know, it's too big. I never needed a car that big. I got it because of it was an iconic vehicle, uh, and it was far too expensive. But it has been incredibly reliable over those 70,000 miles. It's had two full Tesla services in that time. You know, it would have been fine without them, but it was good to have it all checked out. It's had uh, two MOTs, and it passed those without any trouble. Uh, so the only maintenance I've had to do is top up the screen wash and, and change tyres. It had new tyres at around 60,000 miles, uh, and that is a topic that I will be getting to later on in this episode. All the brake pads are original, haven't replaced any of those, and nothing else. It's been absolutely faultless. The range did, without question, drop a little over that 70,000 mile uh, driving over four years. Uh, when I first got it, the thing is, you, I never charged it to 100%, or very rarely. I've probably charged it to 100% six times in that four-year period. It calculated the uh, estimated range to be about 270 miles at 100%. Uh, now it says about 250 uh, if I charge it. The last time I charged it to, to 100%. So it's roughly lost 20 miles of potential range. Uh, but as any electric dri car driver knows, that really is a, 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 a guesstimate. It gives you a rough idea of the range you've got. It totally depends on how you drive. What is pretty obvious, it would take another four years and another 70,000 miles, so a total of 140,000 miles for it to drop another 20 or 25 miles in its range. Still perfectly usable. Now, because of when I got the car, it had free supercharging for life. That is kind of ended with Tesla's. It's not really free because you're paying for it with the car. But, so I can use superchargers for nothing. I've used them all over Europe, but I've used them way less than I would have expected. On average, through the year, I probably am using superchargers once or at the most twice a month. It's not like every time, because 90% of the journeys I do are way, way below what the car is capable of. I've used destination chargers far more. That is far more useful. You drive somewhere, you're not using the car, you're doing something. And if the car is charging then, that's what I think is really important. We need a huge rollout of slower, cheaper destination chargers. Every car park. I saw it in Oslo. It's amazing. When a car park, every space has a charger in it, you don't think about it. What, what am I doing today? Oh, I'm working at the office. I'll leave the car in the car park, plugged in. It'll be charging all the time. I'm not using it. 90% of the time, we don't use cars. That's when we should charge them. So it has been amazing, an amazing privilege to be able to afford that car. It hasn't been easy. 
It's a very expensive lease. I'm really looking forward now to a Tesla Model 3 because the lease is considerably cheaper. Uh, but I really don't regret getting the Tesla Model S. It has been a remarkable, amazing car that I've really loved driving. Anyway, on to more interesting news. Scotland has just produced enough wind energy to power all its homes twice. Now, if you are Scottish or you've been to Scotland, this won't come as a big surprise to you. But Scotland has a lot of onshore wind power generation. Wind turbines in Scotland generated 9,831,320 megawatt hours between January and June 2019. What the numbers mean is that Scotland generated enough electricity to power 4.47 million homes during that period, which is roughly double the amount of homes there are in Scotland. Now, one of the endlessly repeated criticisms of wind turbines is that they kill birds, which they do, but nowhere near as many as cats, traffic, uh, high voltage uh, power lines and pylons, and glass fronted buildings. They slaughter birds by the million, multiple million every year. Wind turbines kill certain birds uh, occasionally. And all the tests that have been done, where they put big nets under the, the, the wind turbines to see how many birds they kill, have produced very, very few kills. It's actually very unusual, but it's a really popular trope. Uh, amongst some people. And to underline this fact, this actual report was published by the World Wildlife Fund of Scotland. And generally speaking, the World Wildlife Fund aren't that keen on technologies that slaughter endless amounts of wildlife. Robin Parker, who is the Climate and Energy Policy Manager at WWF Scotland, said this, up and down the country, we are all benefiting from clean energy, and so is the climate. These figures show harnessing Scotland's plentiful onshore wind potential can provide clean green electricity for millions of homes across not only Scotland, but England as well. And just a reminder that onshore wind is universally accepted as being the cheapest and fastest to install electricity generating technology we currently have. The cheapest. I'm just saying. Anyway, moving on to something much more jolly, the Nobe. I don't know how you say it, N-O-B-E, the Nobe. I think it is the Nobe. It's a really cute electric car from Estonia. I mean, sadly, it's not likely we're going to be able to get there and test drive it anytime soon. But, you know, fingers crossed we'll get the chance one day. The Nobe is a successful crowd-funded vehicle. The Nobe 3 is a three-wheel drive, ultra-light electric car. At 600 kilograms, it's less than half the weight of a very small combustion engine car. It comes in two configurations, the Nobi 100 with a 21 kilowatt hour battery in a range of 210 kilometers or 130 miles, and the Nobi 100 GT with a 25 kilowatt hour battery in a range of 260 kilometers or 160 miles. And as for parking, okay, now I mean, this is a bit of a gimmick, but it really made me laugh. You can literally park this car off the street. So this car was crowdfunded. It seems to be successfully crowdfunded. And I really hope they start to manufacture these cars because they look really cool. An all-wheel drive, three-wheel electric car. I mean, it's pretty... Apparently, it's really good off-road. And finally, particulates from tyres and brakes. And the fact that electric cars produce more toxic particulates than a 10-year-old diesel driving in reverse through a kindergarten playground. Well, that's certainly the impression you get from the mainstream press. But there is an important point here. I mean, if you drive a, 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 any car 20,000 miles, the tyres wear down, and so do the brakes. Now, wh when you wear something down, what happens to the bits that have been worn off? They lie on the road. They are particulates that are made of really nasty stuff, actually. I mean, it's sort of rubber, except it isn't. It's a, it's a fossil fuel derivative. I don't know. You know, we should look at how tyres are made. We're going to look at how tyres are made. But clearly, there's bits of tyre wearing off when you drive along. That happens on electric cars. It happens on combustion engine cars. And the same argument applies to brakes. When you put the brakes on, there's, there's two things rubbing together. Part of that rubbing together process means there's particulates coming off the brake pads. They fall onto the road. They also turn into dangerous particulates that are just lying around in the street. So there's all this particulate matter on the street that either gets kicked up by vehicles that are following, uh, following the car or 
it gets washed down into the water, into the drainage system and eventually washed out to sea. Whatever it is, it's not good. And since we've become more aware of the toxic gases and particulates that are belching out of combustion engine vehicles, we're paying more attention to particulate pollution, which is a good thing. But the argument I've seen repeated endlessly is electric cars produce more particulates from their brakes and tyres than conventional combustion cars because they're heavier. Really? Is this the experience of all the electric vehicle drivers that I've spoken to? You might like to comment about this if you drive an electric car. Have you noticed that your tyres, and particularly your brakes, wear down faster than they used to in uh, combustion engine vehicles? Everyone I've spoken to has said the brakes just last forever. I mean, I've done 70,000 miles in a heavy Tesla Model S and the brakes are still fine. The front two pads need replacing. They pass the MOT, but they're getting near the end of life after 70,000 miles. How long do brake pads last on a similar sized 7 Series BMW with a massive petrol or diesel engine in it? I would suggest a lot less. This is the utterly spurious spin that really gets my goat about this topic. You know, it's so easy to say if you've never driven one, never seen one, and you've just been given a press release and you work in a newspaper or in a television series or on a radio programme and you just get this thing, oh, electric cars make more particulates because they're heavier. End of argument, end of discussion, end of thought. You totally take that on 100%. That's the truth. Blab it out there. And then people read it and go, oh my God, electric cars are actually dirtier than diesel. No, they are bloody not. The simple truth about this is that electric cars wear their tyres less, not more, and they wear their brakes hugely less because of regenerative braking. If you're driving a manual car and you go, accelerate, take your foot off, put the clutch, put, put, change the gear, that jolt wears the tyres more. Everyone knows, every engineer knows that a, that a manual car wears tyres faster than any other vehicle. If you've got an automatic, it's slightly less. If you've got an electric car, it's hugely less. Who benefits from spinning this wretched, stupid story? I can't guess. It's like there's a TV journalist doing a report on landfill, the problems with landfill. And he's standing there in front of a massive pile of domestic waste with a huge machine that's crushing it down above him. And he's standing in front of all this rubbish and he's pointing to a little bottle cap that's resting on the ground near his feet that is produced by an ethical drinks company. He goes, look at that, look at that bottle top. That is disgusting waste. Meanwhile, a mountain of waste is being crushed down behind him. That is what's happening with particulates that are coming from tyres and brakes on electric cars. It's a tiny, minuscule problemette which needs solving. I'm not denying that. It needs to be improved. We need to find different technologies that don't do this or do it a great deal less. But it's a tiny problem compared to the massive, global, overarching monster of billions of, of uh, combustion vehicles belching out toxic fumes that are poisoning people to death. Now more and more people are accepting that the old technology is defunct, that it is too toxic, that it is inefficient, that it is burning a, a, a finite uh, resource, oil, and it is a ridiculous waste. More and more people are accepting that. So what are the people who are defending those technologies, oil, the motor manufacturers, what are they doing? They're saying, oh yeah, but look, over there, there's a, where's an entire spare and the brakes where? It's pathetic and, it's, and we've got to fight back against these spurious stories. All that is true, but also, we also need to improve the technology we're using. And there are some solutions emerging, because this is a real, I'm not pretending this isn't a real problem. It's a real problem and we need to do something about it. It's gonna happen on all cars in the future, even if they're all electric, they are going to leave these particulates on the road and they're not good. I'm not pretending that for a minute, but I'm just trying to keep it in perspective. But we're gonna be covering the work of a company called Enso Tires as soon as we can. Enso Tires are building sustainable, better tires for electric cars that not only in improve range because they're low rolling resistance, but they're made of different materials that don't break up in the same way. And the materials that are left on the road are non-toxic. In fact, we had a wonderful man called G. Lenderson, who was uh, speaking at Fully Charged Live this year. He's from Enso Tires, and they discuss a lot of these issues around particulates coming from, uh, coming, not com coming from tires and brakes. 
uh, uh, Fully Charged Live. It was a really good discussion. It's on Fully Charged Regen and on the podcast if you want to catch up on that one. Well, that's all I've got time for. I just want to thank a few wonderful Patreon supporters who donate $10 a month or more to uh, sustain and maintain the Fully Charged show uh, and all our associated gubbins web page and podcasts and fully charged regen i mean it kind of expanding we're trying to keep it under control we're not trying to expand too much but anyway these are some wonderful people who i'd love to thank chris owens paul thwaite alex kershaw geraint jones dan holmes gary walker Jochen mary brian stewart alan stewart and robert denny thank you so much for your support it really really is crucial uh, to us uh, lots of great shows coming up I've seen a few of them that you haven't seen yet they are amazing uh, Johnny's doing some really brilliant stuff for us it's going to be really good Maddie Moat's doing some fantastic stuff Helen Chesky's done some incredible stuff about heat cameras and how engines get hot and tyres get hot and brakes get hot it's all related to brakes and particulates very exciting stuff coming up anyway that's all please do uh, subscribe to Fully Charged have a look at the Patreon link and as always if you have been thank you for watching 